Hey, what's going on everyone? So I'll just give it a second here. Kind of ran out of coffee, unfortunately, today. So not going to have my traditional cup of coffee. But the good thing is, is I actually have my dad visiting. So we're going to go grab some coffee right after this. And we'll go from there. So let me just roll up these sleeves here. All right. So today we'll be uh, covering how to optimize your gym workouts and your time in the gym and the intensity as well, just so um, you're not wasting your time, uh, which I feel like a lot of people that go to the gym are, and we'll be going over like a certain sequence of steps to, to be able to do that. So Timothy, good to see you. We'll be talking about how to optimize uh, your time in the gym today during our live. Uh, Greg, good to see you as well. So that way you're not going to the gym and kind of wasting a lot of time and not getting much return for that time which a lot of people, unfortunately, that go to the gym do do that. And you see, um, Bob, good to see you as well. Uh, and you do see the majority of people that go to the gym, they may spend actually quite a bit of time there, you know, like an hour, two hours there. And you see them year after year, and they always look the same. They never look any different. If anything, they're just not in good shape to begin with, or they don't look appealing to begin with. And then they just never change. Although, they are spending a tremendous amount of time in the gym. So I'm going to go over steps on how to avoid that. So you get the most time, uh, so you get the most uh, return for your time because I know a lot of you guys are busy working and um, I just don't want to see you going to the gym and kind of wasting a bunch of hours. And then obviously when you don't see the change too, you kind of lose your motivation after a while. It's kind of like, for example, working for free at work, for instance. You know, there's only so long you could do that before you lose your motivation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go down the steps and we'll go from there. So first and foremost, uh, Gerald, good to see you. First and foremost, before beginning any program or any goal in life in general, but especially like any program, since we're going to be focused on gym work here, uh, it's very important to be crystal clear with your goals. I feel this sets the foundation to anything you're trying to achieve and will also give you the appropriate answers for what needs to be done to achieve those goals. So being very crystal clear about those goals is very important. So for a lot of people, you know, they want to be a little bit healthier and lose a bit more weight, uh, lose quite a bit of weight in the beginning. So it is uh, that's great, you know, saying like, oh, I want to lose weight or I want to lose a little bit of body fat and be a little bit healthier. That's a great start. But in my opinion, it's too vague. You need to be more specific in terms of weight loss. Like how many pounds do you exactly want to lose? Uh, you don't need to do a body fat test, although you can do a thing called a DEXA scan, uh, which is very accurate. You can kind of Google DEXA scan in my area. Uh, they're usually at medical centers and they cost anywhere between like 70 to maybe $120, but it gives you a great rundown of your current body fat percentage. And basically whatever number you're at, let's say the average uh, U.S. American is around 25% body fat. Uh, let's say if you're a male, you know, being at 12% is good. 12 to 10% somewhere around there year round is a great number to be at body fat percentage wise. So then you would know, like, let's say you came in at 25%. Okay, I'm at 25% and I need to get down to 12%. At least you could objectively um, objectively track that. And then you can determine, uh, you know, how fast you want to do that. I mean, it's pretty easy to lose 1.2 to 1.5 pounds of body fat per week at any stage of your journey, unless you're extremely low in your body fat percentage already. So then you can gauge like, okay, so I'm going to try to lose 1.2 to 1.5 pounds of body fat per week. Uh, if I need to go from 25% uh, to 12%, how many pounds of fat do I currently have on my body? And then determine how long that would take. That way you can be, um, John, good to see you. Aaron, Jeremy, Oscar, welcome from my, uh, Miami. Good to see you as well. Uh, that way you can determine exactly how long your journey can take, which is important because you want clarity because a lot of times people embark on fitness journeys and they don't have clarity. So the process is very confusing, uh, which could, uh, which could lead to discouragement, right? Because if you don't know, imagine like you get in a car 
and you don't know where you're going and you're just kind of driving. You know what I mean? I mean, it's fun to do from time to time, but it's typically not how you would live your life by, right? You already have an idea of what you, where you need to go before you get in your car. And then you turn on your GPS to get to that location. It shows you exactly how far it is, if there's any traffic, uh, which streets to take, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's how you want to be with your, your fitness and health goals as well. The more precision, the better. So try to stay away from vague statements and vague goals like I need to lose weight or I need to be more healthy. You know, okay, you want to lose weight. Like how much are you trying to lose exactly? Uh, follow those steps I mentioned. Or you want to be healthy? Okay, like what do you mean by healthy? Oh, like I have high blood pressure. Okay, so where is your number currently? Where is a healthy range? And then what do I need to do to get down to that healthy range? Same thing with maybe some people might be concerned with uh, their LDL being way too high. Okay, so where is it currently? Where is a safe range, you know, a healthy range to be at? And how big is the gap? And what do I need to do to close that gap, you know? Or I have chronic energy issues. Okay, so uh, with energy issues, for example, like, you know, when do you feel tired? You know, like midday. Okay, so what do I need to do to stop feeling tired midday? Or do you feel tired, tired all day? Or stuff of that sort. Like identify what your exact health goal is. Uh, sleeping pathologies are very common. So what kind of sleeping pathology do I have? Do I have psychologically induced chronic insomnia? Or do I need to get up and urinate multiple times during the night, which is interfering with quality sleep? Do I feel way too energetic at night? Uh, all these little details are very important to provide clarity in your program design. And without those details and without clarity, your program is going to be too vague, vague and you're not going to have the appropriate direction needed to successfully accomplish your goals in a predictable manner. And what's going to happen is you might achieve some periodic short-term success here and there for sure. But you'll typically run into plateaus, which most people will never overcome. And then obviously, if you're spending a lot of time and commitment going to the gym and all those hours, especially with a busy work schedule, and you get stuck in these plateaus, you get discouraged after a, a little while, but especially in the medium or long term, for sure. And then you and then you quit and then you return back to your old cycles. And then, you know, two years goes by and you come back and, and you do the same exact thing, et cetera, et cetera. So clarity is huge. And being clear on what your goal what your goal is is extremely important. So let me uh, x these guys out that way I can remember what we want to talk about. Another indirect thing that could really help with uh, improving your consistency and also your effort in the gym, so you get the most out of your time, is making sure your health and wellness goals are actually aligned with your purpose in life, right? So um, this varies a tremendous amount, you know, from person to person, everyone has different goals in life, but let's say you're a construction worker, right? And um, you love the work, but you happen to be overweight and you're, you don't have like great endurance, you know, so you get tired at work and that's not able to accomplish your tasks or something of that sort, or maybe you have back pain or something of that sort. So you would need to set up your program design to align with your greater purpose in life. It's the same thing, even if you're like a computer programmer and you have like back pain or um, just lack of energy and focus, you know what I mean? So you can set up your fitness goals to make you a better programmer by improving your, your mental cognition and health and central nervous system management, all that stuff, probably reducing your body fat percentage and thus getting you to focus more at work and thus helping you achieve your greater life purpose a little bit more and stuff of that sort. And even if you don't have like a greater life purpose and you're like, well, I don't know what my purpose is, which is okay. A lot of people are in that area as well. So one good thing is getting in great mental and physical shape, you know? So when you do uncover that purpose or when you uncover various core values that will lead to that purpose, uh, you have great mental and physical health because you're not going to accomplish anything, uh, anything great without that in the beginning, you know, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to accomplish with like major depression or, um, severe chronic fatigue issues or, or chronic sleep issues, or if you're very overweight and, uh, you just don't like how you look and it lowers your self-esteem, that's going to affect your goals in life as well, where the blood work is coming in very poor. 
now you got to take all this medication, which causes various side effects, uh, then that's going to affect your attainment uh, of your goals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So stuff of that sort. So if you do have a goal and purpose, try to get your fitness goals to align with that goal and purpose to help you accomplish that goal and purpose even more because your body and your mind are like a vehicle for your soul, you know? So you need that to be very healthy because if, if that's not healthy, then the vehicle isn't working well. And of course, it, it becomes unsafe to drive or the car breaks down very often. You can look at it that way and you never get to your destination. And um, just to give you an idea, you know, the number one reason for personal bankruptcy in the U.S., which accounts for, I think, close to 70 percent of bankruptcies are health issues. You know, so it's, it's a very uh, it's a very serious thing to take into consideration because any one serious health issue puts a tremendous amount of people into personal bankruptcy very, very quickly. And that, of course, is going to set you back quite a bit in your purpose, right? Because then you're going to have to start over, at least from a materialistic and financial perspective, and then uh, go from there. And a lot of people may not have the uh, the fortitude or, or grit uh, to be able to do that. You know, so a lot of people just succumb to major depression and unless they have like a great circle of friends and family and also in tune with good mental and physical health practices, they typically stay that way for the rest of their life and they typically don't recover either. So being very clear on your goals is important and having that goal in alignment with your greater purpose in life is great as well. Uh, and if once again, you don't have a purpose, it's totally okay just attend to your mental and physical health goals. So at least when that comes around or when some great project comes around that you enjoy, you at least have the mental and physical health to be able to tackle the challenges of that project. And any project that's worth pursuing is gonna be very challenging from a myriad of different vantage points. So being very mentally sharp, uh, mentally healthy and well, and physically healthy will help you tackle those challenges as they arise. And 100% they will arise with any journey that's worth pursuing. Uh, it's inevitable. So you got to be ready for that. Uh, so once you've kind of established clear goals and ideally align those goals with your purpose, a great next step is to establish a good starting place. So one of the things I mentioned is you can take a DEXA scan. Another thing before starting any workout program, what's important to consider is, is your current state of posture, you know, like, do you have like any overly tight, overly worked muscles combined with overly extended or long musculature? How's your posture? Do you have um, noticeable upper cross and lower cross syndrome, which is very common. So upper cross syndrome would be like the rounding of the shoulders, protruding head. Uh, lower cross syndrome would be kind of like more over the Donald Duck shape in the hips and the lower back. So the hips are typically tilted forward with the butt kind of sticking up diagonally. And there is noticeable excessive curvature in the lower back, uh, which is tough for the spinous processes of the uh, posterior elements of the lower back. So it does cause arthritis after a while and also possibly could increase the chances of an anterior disc herniation as well, uh, which are uh, not as common as a posterior disc herniation for sure, but they do happen. So what's important to consider is your current state of posture, because especially most people are going to be working out in the gym. You don't want to be loading poor posture, right? You want to correct that poor posture first uh, through a corrective phase of some sort, a reconditioning phase. And then once you have the musculature aligned in a balanced way, then you begin to load that muscle by doing, you know, for example, if, if you need to even, a barbell back squat or deadlift or something of that sort. But it would be pretty silly to start a person that has extreme rounding of the shoulders and protrusion of the head. It would be pretty silly to start loading the bar and doing a barbell back squat with that person, for example. So to keep it safe and to keep you injury free, attending to that postural element is going to be pretty important. And also just for aesthetics as well. You know, it's great to stand with good posture. It makes you look more confident. It makes you look leaner as well. Uh, so that needs to be attended to. Uh, oh, your overall health is important to consider as well. How's your, how's your digestion currently? 
how's your mental health? How's your musoskeletal health? Like, do you have any serious knee pain or any serious elbow pain uh, or any serious neck pain or discomfort or over tightness or stuff of that sort? Uh, how's your adrenal health? You know, a lot of people are so overworked and so overburdened that probably starting them on a CrossFit style training routine will just throw them further into the ground of, of fatigue and exhaustion. So maybe doing more working in or more very light and um, uh, not as intense or well-developed like split routines or bodybuilding routines might be better for that person than, um, you know, like a high, high intensity CrossFit uh, workout of like, you got to do 20 squats here, run over here, do like 30 pull-ups or whatever, run over here, um, do 10 other exercises, which tends to be like very, very tough on the central nervous system. And if the central nervous system is already very burdened or very exhausted, it just throws that person deeper into exhaustion. And you're not going to build, you're not going to build muscle or an impressive looking physique uh, or be more energized or feel more healthy when you're approaching fitness of that level from an exhausted state, which unfortunately a lot of people are. Um, not that they can't do that, but they would have to attend to various health variables first and become healthy enough to be able to do that first. And then you got to ask the deeper question. It's like, do I even need to be doing that to accomplish my goals? That's why it's important to be very clear on your goals because you can then determine the type of fitness or the type of programs uh, you should be on to accomplish those goals, right? So if your goal, for example, is to build a beautiful body and to be lean and healthy, you don't have to do high intensity training. I don't do high intensity training. I never got into high intensity training at all. Uh, in fact, like just traditional bodybuilding workouts could be great for you if I would recommend doing some integration, integrative movements as well, not just all isolations on machines and stuff of that sort, uh, but just more like split routines are great on an undulating periodization program or something of that sort, well-developed. Of course, watching stuff on YouTube and stuff of that sort, you got to be careful with following people's advice, which includes me as well, because at the end of the day, um, even if the person knows what they're talking about, they never met you personally. Uh, so if they never met you personally, they can't really give you advice specifically. And you do need that specific advice uh, to be able to succeed medium and long term. Maybe not short term, but medium and long term for sure. Um, if you want success, if you want to stay injury free, the program really has to be individualized and hyper focused on your specific needs. So if like, for example, you have two subjects, right? Subject one is 20 pounds overweight. Let's just say they're the same age, they're 30 pound male or 30 year old males, both of them, let's say both are white, both are 20 pounds overweight, both are the same height, both are even from the same company and in the same department with the same degrees from the same college and they're twins, right? So the reason one person gained 20 pounds could be completely different from the reason of why another person gained 20 pounds. Let's say this one twin gained 20 pounds because of the stress of his divorce, right? Okay, uh, you gotta meet the problem at the level of the problem then versus this other twin gained 20 pounds um, because he's just not health conscious and doesn't really care, you know what I mean? He just likes eating junk food and drinking, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, you gotta meet the problem at the level of the problem. And then also let's say subject one has back pain, lower back pain. Let's say he has a posterior, um, posterior disc herniation on the L5 S1 to the left side, where the next subject uh, has a posterior disc herniation on his C1 and C2, you know, in his neck to the right side. So obviously their programs and their starting places are gonna be way different. And that's why it's important, especially when you hire a trainer or go to a doctor of any sort or any health professional, they are thoroughly assessing you uh, because if they are not assessing, they are guessing. I don't know where that saying, go, uh, where I got that saying from. I've heard it many places, definitely not mine, but it's true. And all the coaches I hired personally over the years have at least done like an hour to two hours minimum. Some of them are even three to four hour assessments. I tend to do about three 
to four hour assessments with clients, three hours up front, and then there's another personality type assessment uh, later on in, in the program. Uh, so we can work on the person managing their personality in a balanced and healthy way. So overall, I mean, it's a four hour, three and a half to four hour assessment process. And this is, I would say the bare minimum requirement upon first meeting a client. So if I were to go to a doctor and they're not providing me that kind of in-depth assessments, I would, I would not go to that doctor. And also I would not go to that trainer or physical therapist or any specialist at that, that really isn't that thorough in the assessment process because they will overlook minor details. And it's in the minor details where a successful well-built program uh, originates from. So it's very important, okay, uh, to have that done. And if you're not getting that from your healthcare provider, uh, like personally, it's up to you, of course, but personally, I would run away and find someone more competent or more caring. Because a lot of times in healthcare, especially, I go by the saying, once again, not mine, but I don't care about how much you know until I know about how much you care, which is very, very important, uh, especially like I try to stay away from very business-minded and rushed healthcare providers, especially if you see like you go to a doctor's office and they have kind of a revolving door or you see this in chiropractors very often. It's like they come in, boom, five-minute assessment, two-minute assessment, give you your medication or give you your adjustment out the door, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much more, so much more to healing a person and in order to really heal the person, you really need to know the person's story of how they got there. Because 99.5% of the time, it's just the person doing it to themselves. So as a healthcare provider, one of our main goals is not only educating the person on, you know, basic stuff like proper nutrition, central nervous system management, using movement as medicine, et cetera, et cetera, but also teaching the person how to stop hurting themselves, whether it be mental or physical, etc cetera, etc cetera. because if you don't stop the person or you don't change the belief system that's leading to problem abc well you don't have to be a phd in anything to realize that problem is just going to keep coming back right like a good example is like let's say uh, one of your family members has a gambling problem so it's not going to make sense to just keep giving them money uh if that gambling problem isn't solved as walensky would say and i use this phrase often you got to meet the problem at the level of the problem and the majority of the time is just really just changing the person's belief system that led to their problems. And without doing that, you're really just falling into symptom management loopholes, which are great money-making machines for the healthcare provider, but really don't help the customer in any meaningful and long-lasting way. It doesn't at all. And in fact, there is a name for these customers in healthcare. They're called like the 401k clients or as Paul Cech would say, the, the BMW fund client, because they stay well enough to keep coming back, but they never resolve their issues, so they have to keep coming back, right? So you can add them to your retirement plan and uh, thank them later on because they're gonna keep coming back and spending their hard-earned money, but never coming to a complete resolution of either their back pain or their depression or their high blood pressure or their excess body fat issues or, or the myriad of other health issues that people experience constantly, gut issues, because people refuse to change their diets and stuff of that sort, or reduce their stress. So, okay, let me just read through these notes. Clear place, posture, overall health. I can't read what I wrote there. I can't read my own handwriting oftentimes, but that's okay. Uh, let's go on to the next one. So the next step is once you got all that figured out through being very clear with your goals, and then also, you know, having the background of how healthy you are and where is your starting place currently and where do I need to go or want to go? And then knowing the distance and the best now, since we know where we are and we know where we want to go, the next step is to find the best vehicle of how to do that. Okay. So this is important too, because once again, I think I mentioned this earlier in the call, like if your goals are, you know, to be like, have a great looking physique, um, be healthy, let's just say, have great energy. Like you don't need to do beat down workouts. You don't need to do power lifting. Um, you just need to do routines that are specifically focused on that. 
that is key. You don't want to be doing anything extra or especially anything that's very high risk but very low reward for your specific goal. Okay? So that is so important. You got to find the right vehicle to get you to your destination, which at the macro level includes what type of fitness do you want to be doing, but at the micro level includes what type of exercises in that routine are important for you to do. Uh, so I would argue, you know, like if you want, like say big quads, just doing um, leg presses, for example, or doing a hack squat uh, intelligently, you know, leg presses in the sense of not going all the way down to the point of where you get rounding in your lower back at the end, but keeping that tailbone firmly on the pad, will build bigger looking quads and better looking quads than a barbell back squat for most people. And... Uh, more importantly, it's not as dangerous as a barbell back squat, okay? So not saying a barbell back squat is dangerous. It is dangerous, I would say, if a person doesn't have thorough education on the mechanics of the body, also hasn't addressed various postural issues, uh, is in a chronic state of fatigue. So I would say for most Americans in their current state of health, a barbell back squat is really dangerous, uh, probably way too tough to explain because they're typically in a very myopic and stressed state. Uh, but a leg press might be a great substitute and then you would need to integrate it somehow into a, uh, you need to integrate the core, for example, by doing cable wood chops or some, something of that sort, okay? But doing a leg press, doing a hack squat are great for building big, beautiful looking quads. You don't necessarily have to do a back squat, which is also a good exercise but more risk to reward. And also I would argue just tougher on the central nervous system. Most people aren't sleeping well, so they'll be more exhausted and fatigued. Um, also the fact that the weight of the bar has to travel through your whole entire spine. And most people have some kind of undiagnosed disc bulge already that's just waiting to pop out posteriorly just a little bit more. And then once it hits that nerve, uh, you're either gonna be in a world of pain for a few weeks or quite a while. Uh, especially if you don't know anything about back pathologies, spine hygiene, or anything of that sort. So there's too much risk, in my opinion, for the average citizen to be able to do that, unless they're really willing and focused to correct a lot of that stuff we mentioned already earlier in the call, and on a myriad of our other calls and stuff of that sort. So picking the right type of exercise is going to be super important. And then you also need to understand how to build out a fully periodized, ideally undulating periodized program to match those goals. And this is where you need to either hire someone to help you with this, uh, like myself, for example, or you need to become your own mechanic uh, because this requires a lot of trial and error for the most part on your part to know what perfectly suits you in a thorough, comprehensive assessment. So buying a lot of those pre-made programs online won't work long-term. Also, they don't know your injury history. If you're able to, like, like if you have a posterior disc injury anywhere down your spine or you have bad knees. So a lot of times when you pay for those pre-made programs, uh, they send it to you without knowing anything about you. And of course, a lot of those exercises aren't gonna work or optimize your results for you or re-injure you as well. Because once again, the person never met you personally and just filling out that very short questionnaire uh, that they might have you fill out, if that is not enough. You really have to do a thorough, comprehensive movement assessment, spine assessment, posture assessment. Also like a health assessment questionnaire is gonna be very important. Ideally a GI map test a Dutch test possibly also just to get a full comprehensive view of a good starting place for that person so you can really customize that program for that specific individual. That is so important. And that's why you got to be very careful with following personalities online, especially fitness personalities. Um, a lot of the top guys are just doing a lot of drugs, you know, so obviously their program and their advice might work for them because they're you know, doing a lot of drugs and stuff of that sort, it's probably not gonna work for you, especially if you're working you know, 40, 50 hours a week uh, and stuff of that sort. And once again, they just never met you. That's the big thing. They never met you, so how could they possibly know what kind of advice to give you? How do they know your life goals, your current circumstances, your current schedule, 
uh, how many hours you're working and how many hours you can commit to this, how important this is to you. All these things are so important uh, and so overlooked. That's why a lot of people, when they try to get stuff online, you never really see them changing. Unless, of course, they really dive into the self-education themselves, then for sure. But get ready to read at least like two to three books a month and read up a lot of studies on PubMed.gov. Take courses, at least two to three courses a year on that subject, whatever that the health issue you're trying to solve. And then reach out and hire some mentors from time to time. That's huge. No one, no successful person, I guarantee you, in your company or on TV or anything has done it themselves. They had a myriad of mentors, most of which they had to pay for to get there. You're not, you're just not going to know everything, even if you're thoroughly studying yourself, which I do recommend doing for sure, but you're not going to overcome the experience level or the wisdom of a person that's been doing it for 15, 20 years, and that's successfully done it themselves. And more important, if you're looking for mentorship, that's to successfully show it how successfully showed other people how to do it as well. A myriad of other people from different educational backgrounds, ideally from um, ec different economic backgrounds, different starting places. If they have a large list of testimonials, successful testimonials of what you're looking for too, that's huge. And that speaks more volumes than like any degree or how successful they are or how fit they are or whatever. Can they really teach that information to others, which is a unique skill in and of itself and is beyond just knowing the information yourself. That's super important. Uh, a good mentor is also a person that knows how to get people to change their behavior. Because a lot of times, especially in my field, you run into a lot of people that might be actually very intelligent in nutrition uh, or exercise science. But they don't, once again, know how to get the person to change the belief system that led to their problems. And once again, without doing that, you really are just falling into symptom management loopholes, uh, which will produce maybe short-term results for sure. But you will have no complete resolution of your symptoms, whatever those symptoms may be um, at the end. So you'll be running around in circles and once again, falling into that like 401k client plan. Okay, cool. So obviously, you know, getting on the right exercise program that's aligned with your goals is important. Being clear about those goals, being clear about where your starting place is and where you need to be going. And then also being clear about your what nutrition you need to do to or what supplement program you need to be on to help support that as well, help support your workout. And you can get something like a GI map test to know how your digestion is currently working, what sensitivities you have, and customize a nutrition program specifically for what you're looking for in yourself, uh, for in, in your performance, and also in your goals. Okay, so that's how you can be precise without having to guess, all right, and have it have your journey be a lot more predictable, which will give you a lot more confidence, which is important too, because if it's predictable. And you know, like, if I do this amount per week, I'll get this kind of output. That's what makes you want to keep coming back. If you're like just in the dark all the time, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. You get to the gym, you make it up on the fly. Um, I don't know what these foods are or whether I should be eating these foods or at what quantities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I spend a lot of time with my clients focusing on nailing that down for their specific needs. And that's going to be important for you to do as well and not be wishy-washy about that especially, especially not fall into fad diet loopholes, fasting, um, I would even say the carnivore diet, paleo diet, etc., etc. Everything has a place and time for sure, but you got to know if that place and time is right for you. Because usually when I hear people say they're doing fad diet XYZ, keto, fasting, whatever, uh, cockroach diet, whatever else is on the market, it instantly almost tells me the person doesn't have much in understanding about nutrition or health in general. And they're looking for kind of like a shortcut to their goal, which will never happen. It will never happen. You Once again, you might achieve some short-term results for sure, but long-term you'll be back to exactly where, um, where you are, especially with fat loss clients that approach um, their goals just from an, I need to work out more and I need to change my diet perspective. 
if they just approach it from that limited vantage point, uh, they will 100, almost 100% 100 from my observation relapse within a two to three year period. And that's actually what the statistics show. The average person that loses any amount of weight regains it within a two to three year period, simply because they approach it from this, I need to just change my diet or eat less or do this fad diet and work out a little bit more perspective, uh, which I teach my clients to stay far away from. And we tackle it from a myriad of other variables to make sure they create that lasting change for themselves. Because the only fat loss program that works is ironically the only one where you don't have to do it again. Sure, you might have to lose a little teeny bit of weight here and there for sure, but it's not like you're going to have to lose like 30, 40, 50 pounds again. Okay, it's just going to be like some touch ups here and there basically. All right, so if you catch yourself losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight, gaining weight, um, you're probably falling into these loopholes of thinking really that I just need to change my diet and my workout plan and everything will work out. Um, where in fact, that's probably the equivalent of telling a person that has an alcohol problem, for example, like, uh, oh, you just need to stop drinking. It's like, dude, obviously, <laughs> obviously he would benefit from start drink, stop drinking he or she or whatever would benefit from stop dr not drinking any longer. Uh, but it goes far and above beyond that kind of advice. And that's why a lot of family members, um, they mean the best, but they don't know what they're talking about when they tell their overweight family members they just need to eat better and work out more and all their problems would disappear, okay? Uh, on the surface, that seems like the right answer, but once again, it's too limited. Even if the person takes, up, takes them up on that advice, you may lose weight initially, but almost 100% from my observation, within two to three years, they will regain all their weight and even more, uh, which is why I stepped away from that kind of coaching well over 10 to 12 years ago and um, go about it in a more comprehensive way. So some other things to consider to get the most out of your gym workouts are, are you sleeping well? Eight hours a day, maybe even 20 minute midday naps, or, or at least on workout days is already a huge upgrade. You wanna be sleeping between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. roughly and your body repairs itself physically from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and mentally from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., okay? So that means you actually have to be really sleeping during those intervals, not like you get to bed at 10 p.m. and then you're really actually asleep at 11 p.m., and then if you average out your week, it looks like you lost um, seven hours of physical repair time. So of course you're gonna be chronically tired and not able to recover from workouts effectively, um, especially when you're 35 plus, you know? Your sleeping better be on point if you wanna optimize your health, if you wanna optimize your appearance, uh, and if you wanna optimize your energy levels as well to once again, get the most out of your workouts and stuff of that sort. And if you kind of suffer from psychologically induced chronic insomnia and stuff of that sort, frequent urination at night. I've done many videos on that before. Uh, feel free to check them out in this page. Uh, I won't be covering them in detail though. So a lot of times too, I see this, especially in American culture very often, um, is people can't get the most out of their workouts because their life is just unsustainable. They're working way too many hours. They're way too stressed out. Um, even on their days off, instead of resting and trying to recover as best as they can, they're out doing stuff like running errands. Um, they got some coworkers they don't like working with at work or, or over demanding boss, or maybe not an over demanding boss, but just an incompetent boss maybe. Uh, all this stuff really taxes the central nervous system quite a bit. There's also internal issues issues to consider. A lot of people have this internal critic, you know, and if it's not checked and appropriately dealt with, that could cause a lot of exhaustion too. Or this internal fantasy self they're constantly comparing themselves to, which is an unrealistic version of who they are. And there's obviously a gap, which is gonna cause a lot of stress because you're never living up to this, to this image of this fantasy self. And that could cause a lot of exhaustion because it leads to a sense of emptiness. You're never, you're never good enough, which could lead to either depression or overcommitment to work, you know, being a workaholic, which will definitely send your uh, adrenal glands into a disastrous oblivion. And you're going to have excess cortisol production, uh, which will make you feel 
extremely anxious and, and have anger issues. And then after a long period of time, once your adrenals say enough is enough, they stop producing cortisol to an extent. And then all of a sudden you get adrenal fatigue issues. Then you get into a depressive state, chronic fatigue state. Then obviously you're not going to be uh, optimizing your gym workouts at all at that point, you know, maybe not even wanting to go to the gym or recover from workouts. So your body feels all the time achy and beat up and stuff of that sort. Then unfortunately people just get on more medical drugs instead of addressing the issue of what's causing all of this, which sends them into a deeper downward spiral of, um, mental disaster, mental and physical disaster. Uh, Dustin, good to see you. Hope all is well. Mark, Bill, I see a bunch of other people jumped in. Tony, Ron, Thomas, Larry, Joe, Oscar, good to see you. Yep, no problem, man. Sergio, John, good to see you guys. Uh, Dustin as well, I think I just mentioned your name. So all these things are super important to consider and you can see why just approaching it from a, I need to work out more and eat a little bit better is a too short-sighted approach that will, there are no absolutes of course, but will most likely not work for the bulk majority of people in creating a complete resolution of their symptoms. That's really the main thing. What's the point of embarking on any health journey if it's not gonna resolve the health issue? You know, and a lot of people aren't thinking about it that way. They're just thinking about managing the symptom like, oh, I'm fat, so I need to get rid of the body fat. Okay, well, that's managing the symptom, not dealing with what led to all the behaviors that led to that excess weight gain. And you got to meet the problem at the level of the problem. That's extremely critical if you want a complete resolution of your symptoms. Or once again, you're just going to be a 401k client for the healthcare providers, never getting better, always looking worse year after year, gaining more and more weight year after year, being put on more and more dangerous drugs year after year and um, giving more money to a healthcare system that is broken and not working. It's not working. Americans are the sickest uh, humans on the entire planet in the history of planet Earth, in the history of the Homo sapien, in the history of all 29 plus human species that have come and gone over the last 2 million plus years. Sickest people on the planet. Sickest people, which is sad because uh, like mentally and physically sick which is sad because this country is doing great on so many different levels, you know, but they've totally, um, somehow the population of the country has been brainwashed to believe what's not important is most important. Uh, and what's most important is least important, meaning your mental and physical health is least important. And a lot of people don't say that, but their actions say that, you know, if you look at people's actions, it's like, you have to be in a terrible state mentally and physically to be like very overweight and a bunch of mental uh, on medical drugs. And a lot of people don't even see that because it's been normalized. Everyone, everyone, almost everyone is like that, which is, which is the scariest part, which is the saddest part. It's not scary. It's just sad because, um, real health, it's so inexpensive if you know the right things to do. And it actually provides a real solution and real resolution when the person is ready to change. But of course, if they're not ready to change, then all they got is, is medical drugs and dangerous medical drugs and um, all sorts of other BS that would keep them, keep them alive in their miserable state a little bit longer so they could be milked for more money but not actually get better and um, then eventually die and they get another guy, you know? And unfortunately, a lot of these people have kids too and they teach their kids to be the same exact way, which is the saddest, saddest thing of all. So some other things that could help, um, and I kind of hinted at this already, that can help with your focus and intensity at the gym is attending to any love-hate relationships in your life. This could be very distracting, like a boss you don't get along with or something of that sort. It may require you to change your jobs, change your friends, change your career, move states, maybe move countries. I had many clients move country, move uh way. I've even had one client, which I did an interview with Megan Valentine, uh, amazing friend, I consider her actually, um, you know, quit her computer science job because it was just driving her into the ground, although she was making great money and had 10 years of experience. And she had a baby and didn't want to be that negative example to the baby because kids are always watching you. 80% of what they learn is just from watching you. So if they're watching you be a workaholic on a, 
a bunch of medical drugs, eating poorly, they're going to do the same exact thing uh, because they're just learning how to survive in this world from you initially heavily. And they're just going to do the same exact thing. And if it's not benefiting you, if it's making you look terrible and feel miserable, how do you think that's going to make them feel? Same exact thing. So she moved, she had a great story about moving off grid. I did an interview with her. Uh, she bought some land in like central California, I believe, or something of that sort. Um, and just relies on hunting, building skills for her ranch, solar power, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's super cool. Uh, super cool. Uh, because I found also with especially fat loss clients, if they don't, uh, if they successfully complete a program and they lose a bunch of weight, but they don't change the environment where they found themselves gaining all that weight or all of those health issues, the chances of them relapsing are actually pretty damn high if they stay in that same exact environment, even if the fat loss program is a success. If they stay in that same exact environment, um, no absolutes, of course, you'll find exceptions to this, but more times they not, more times than not, they do relapse and regain all their weight. That health issue comes back. Even if they resolve one health issue, just another health issue comes back and they're just kind of chasing symptoms their entire life from one symptom to another. And although they're putting work and effort into it, they, for some reason, keep getting worse and worse and worse and looking worse and feeling worse. So something to consider. Um, another thing that could really help you and that kind of goes back to purpose here is, 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 is a lot of people just have a story gap at the end of the day. And um, a common story gap is like, I want to be doing, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, like I want to be an artist, but uh, they get into being a manager at uh, some hospital or some manufacturing plant or whatever, or a lawyer. Okay, well, there's a huge story gap there, you know? You want to be on the beach or some art house or whatever painting, but you're doing these this category paperwork for the warehouse or doing this very detailed legal work as a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. And the wider that story gap, the more maladaptive behavior you'll have to form over your lifetime because you're not being, you're being fake to yourself at the end of the day and you know it. And a lot of people create stories to justify that. Like, oh, I do this for my retirement plan or, or stuff of that sort. But look at it this way. First of all, the retirement crowd, when I hear people say like, I'm investing all this money into my retirement plan. So first and foremost, that's pretty silly strategy for most people in America, because for most Americans, midlife for them is 30 years old, actually. Uh, a lot of the average age of death in America is about 73 years old or 75 years old. Last time I checked, I forgot somewhere around there. So midlife really is. But remember, a lot of people die before that. So I'd say midlife really is around 30 to 32 years old for most people. So you're telling me you're going to spend, let's say, 30 or 40 years of your life until you're 60, 65, working for retirement so you can live out your retirement for two or three years before you die. And most likely those last few years are in extremely poor health because the person never took care of themselves before anyways. And chances are they're not even going to make it to retirement. Many, almost 800,000 Americans die of heart attacks every single year. Um, and that's just the ones that die. Many, for example, 50% of people roughly that have a heart attack, they don't die either. Okay. But they do possibly have some negative health, health consequences from that. Or how many people die from strokes? 125,000 or so die from strokes every year. Those are just deaths. But imagine how many people are crippled from strokes every year. Actually, I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's like three or four times that much. So 500,000, uh, they lose feeling in the side of their face or their ability to use their arm or leg or something of that sort. Okay. Or um, how many people die from cancer every year? You know, what, one out of every two Americans develops cancer now and half of them die from it. So what what's what's your strategy there with like, if you do work for a retirement plan, keep yourself healthy enough so you could actually enjoy it because it's it's mind boggling for me to see, especially like people that are very overweight, obsessed with their retirement plan. I'm like, dude, you're most likely not even going to make make it to use that. You know, so you're just wasting your life, most likely working a job you don't want around people you don't want to be around. Uh, 
and in hopes of like exchanging 40 years of that miserable existence for like five years or 10 years of like freedom. But then you've been stuck in that miserable mindset for so long, you really don't even know what to do with your free time once the free time arises. It's like the dumbest plan in the world and it's totally fear driven, uh, zero purpose and um, total, totally wasteful, a waste of life. So something to consider with the story gap, because if there is that wide story gap, you really don't have some drive or some purpose or something to strive for, right? Uh, so it's going to impact your gym activities as well, your gym intensity. And then also just your friends, you know, your friends, family, coworkers, if they're not into it and they're all very overweight, they've normalized mental and physical pathology, they're all on a bunch of psychiatric drugs, uh, other pharmaceutical, dangerous pharmaceutical drugs, that's going to be, that's going to wear off on you. You know, like the saying goes, you are the average of the four or five people you hang out with the most. And if the four or five people you're hanging out with are all very overweight, um, all drugged up, you know, on their medical drugs and stuff of that sort, well, you know, that's probably going to happen to you as well, unless you're like extremely, extremely careful. Personally, I would probably try to distance myself from those people and create more health conscious people that are in the same mission and mindset as you. That's important. Very important. Extremely important, actually. This is why sometimes, like I mentioned, it goes into that environment perspective. If a person accomplishes a fat loss program or a health journey, but stays in the same environment with the same surroundings and group of friends that led to that issue, the chances, no absolutes, of course, but the chances of that issue returning are quite high. So that sets all of that stuff we went over is critical to optimizing gym intensity and consistency for the long term because that's what's going to need to happen. You're going to need to be consistent and it's going to need to be a huge part of your lifestyle. And if you don't have all these systems in place to support that, you're going to crumble. You're not going to be, you're going to be very inconsistent. It's going to be very tough to have your goals be sustainable which is why I work so heavily with clients on a lot of these things because just giving them workout plans and nutrition advice is, is too limiting to cause any kind of real change in the person, okay? In most, pretty much all cases, especially when you're dealing with the general population, not the athletic, not the um, pro athlete population, for example. So some other little things you can do once all of this in place uh, some other things that help me personally is having cool music, having great music, you know, that you can take with you to the gym and try not to listen to that music until you're at the gym. So it really kind of hypes you up. And obviously you need to create new tracks after a while, which do take a little bit of effort, um, but it's okay. It does really make a good difference if you get some good, good soundtracks going for you. Um, the time of the day, I find personally morning workouts to be the best. Because especially if you're super busy, I happen not to be super busy, but a lot of you probably are. But morning workouts are great because for a few reasons. One, the workout is done, right? So whatever comes up during the day, it doesn't really matter because you've already finished your workout. And that could help with consistency. That could help a lot of people with consistency. Uh, but you got to know yourself, you know, if you like working out midday more, go for it. There are advantages to working out midday too. If you like working out more at night and you're able to maintain your sleep schedule, go for it. You just got to find out what works well for you. Once again, there's no set track. Uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have to do like some AB testing and see what works well for you and, um, and just go with that, you know? So I also like working out in the morning too, because you get that me time out of the way, especially if you're in the service industry, it's important to get your me time in so you could recharge because that's how you recharge. So you can focus on other people's problems and stuff of that sort in a patient way uh, when you do have to show up to work. Another plus of working out that early in the morning, especially if you're able to take a quick nap after your workout is you show up to work super energized, at least for the first half of the day for sure. I mean, you are amped up and ready to work instead of waking up at work. So, uh, okay, cool. So that covers it, you know, all that music and those little things are obviously help and stuff of that sort, but the real bulk of the success comes from all that stuff we've mentioned and more. That's just a bit of the stuff. I don't want to go over the top on our call today. My dad is visiting, so I want to spend some time with him. 
I'm going to actually go hang out with him right after this. But that's how you would approach it. If you're ready for honest change, if you're not and you want to run around in circles and waste your time and stuff of that sort, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, if you're okay with that. And if you're not okay with that, then, you know, you got to approach it from a multidimensional perspective, which is what we kind of covered here. If you want uh, a complete resolution of whatever your goals may be, something of that sort. So something of what we covered here, plus a few other things I left out uh, just for the sake of keeping this call to one hour. Okay. So it was great to see you guys. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, Dean, Pat, good to see you. Dan, good jumping in as well. Dustin, Bill. Yep. Hey, no problem, Tony. I didn't even see you jumped in. Good to see you as well. Hope you have a good weekend. Uh, Thomas, Larry, Joe, Oscar, Sergio, John, Jeremy, Aaron, Jim, Gerald, Bob, all the time. Thanks for jumping in. I think you jump in on these calls more than anyone else. Uh, Timothy, Greg, and I see a few other people jumped in as well. But great to see you guys. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you guys next week. Take care.